Okay, we shall start. Let's see. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter in Math Physics Seminars. We are very happy to have uh, Han Yan from Rice University. He will be speaking about recent work with Kevin and uh, Andre on fractal orders in hyperbolic space and the layer excitations with fractal mobility. Uh, audience, please feel free to interact and ask questions. Interact with Han and ask questions during his talk. Let's directly welcome Han. Please, thank okay. you. Uh, thanks a lot, Juven, for having me here. And uh, thank you to everyone for being here today. Uh, so today I'll talk uh, a bit about the fractal orders um, in hyperbolic space, which I'll explain what it is. And um, as the new features uh, from this work is really the excitations in this um, kind of fractal orders that um, uh, have very, um, say, new mobility features. So this work is in this preprint, and uh, it is done in collaboration with Kevin Slago, uh, who just moved from Caltech to Rice as a new faculty, and also my supervisor, Andrew Nevidomsky. Yeah. So I want to start by saying that the quantum liquid or this uh, topological order is a say, has has been here for a while and it's uh, definitely one of the most exciting uh, discoveries in quantum many body physics. Um, so uh, traditionally, our understanding of matter using Ising ferromagnet as an example is that. Uh, they are usually described by this uh, lambda paradigm, which means you identify the symmetry and all the parameters, and uh, the system usually breaks some symmetry at low temperature after phase transition. And normally, this kind of phases are short range entangled. Yeah. So um, a more rigorous definition is that if you use some local unitary circuit to map this uh, uh, ground states. In um, if, if you design the unitary circuits correctly, then you can basically disentangle all the quantum entanglement. So uh, this uh, quantum state uh, will become just a trivial product state. So this is quite a different in quantum liquid or topological order, um, whose examples include the quantum Hall state uh, and Tori code, which I'll explain a bit more in detail later, and also more recently fractal order. So for this, uh, for these phases, first what people realized is that there is no other parameter that um, describe the, um, the phase. And uh, what's more is that there is long range topological entanglement and uh, such quantum entanglement cannot be disentangled by this um, local unitary circuit of finite depth. So in some sense, they are a lot more quantum than, the, than these short range entangled states. So uh, one of perhaps most well-known example is Tori code discovered by Kitaev. So this is um, a 2D model of qubit on a, on a square lattice and the qubit sit on the links of the lattice. So uh, in the Hamiltonian, there are two terms. The first one is this um, product of the four Z operators on the uh, vertex. And the second type of terms are this uh, product of X terms um, on uh, say on a plaquette or a loop of the square lattice. So um, a nice feature of this type of Hamiltonian is that all these terms commute with each other yeah, so the ground state can have um, it can be an eigenstate of all these terms simultaneously. So that enables you to write down the ground state almost expl explicitly. Um, in the case of Tori code, if you forget about the x term and you only look at the a term, the z z z z term, then um, this is kind of uh, so the ground states for for this term is then just um, can be just these uh, classical states, which are made up of these loops. Uh, the meaning of these loops is that um, the z takes the value uh, plus one on these red links and uh, say minus one on the uncolored links. So 
um, defined by this term. So as long as these loops close and don't have an open end, uh, that's going to be in the low energy state of this A terms. So that's going to be a ground state of, of this Hamiltonian. So in some sense, this is just imposing a divergence-free Gauss law for the Z2 charge on each vertex. And then you can uh, put in the B terms. So the B terms, uh, X, 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 will simply uh, flip, the, flip the color configurations on the vertex. And the, the red one become um, black and the black links become red. Uh, so by doing this, what, ha what happens is that you are going to uh, hop one of this loop classical loop configuration to another classical loop configuration and so on. So, um, so in the end, all these uh, classical ground states get mixed together by this B term. And they, by um, superimposing all of them together, they become the eigenstates of these B terms as well. So this uh, massive superposition of all these closed loop configurations is then your ground state. And uh, as you can see, there is a huge uh, degeneracy, a huge, um, not degeneracy, but the, ground, the quantum ground state is made up of this huge number of uh, product states. And, uh, and all these states basically obey this um, divergence-free Gauss law of the Z2 charge. Yeah, so basically that's uh, essentially what gives you the topological entanglement that is is, for example, if I take a cut of the system and then all the all the links on the colored orange will collect, collectively know that um, in this gray region, the total Z2 charge has to be zero. So that's one bit of information shared by these orange links, and that gives you the topological entanglement entropy. And also, if you put this system on a torus, you will have this uh, topological degeneracy. And uh, uh, this is because if you take a cut across the lattice and uh, for example, a vertical cut, and you count the number of red links that goes, go through this cut. For example, here is two, here is two. And uh, okay, I didn't have a good example, but uh, in, for some other loop configurations, it can be four six um, or, or any other even number. So what you will see, what you will find is that uh, this B term will never um, hop one of these uh, even cut loops to this odd cut, odd cut loops. Yeah, uh, which means these two configurations are not, are not um, uh, connected by the Hamiltonian. So that tells you, uh, given this cut, uh, actually, uh, it uh, divides the, um, the ground state into two sectors by the, say, number of red links being uh, even or odd. And of course, you have also another cut along the other loop, so that gives you four ground states. And these ground states are, de the ground state degeneracy is really determined by the topology of your manifold. Say, if your manifold has more handles, then you will have more uh, degenerate ground states. And uh, another interesting feature of this uh, quantum liquid is that um, their excitations are generally anions. In this case, you have this effective E and M particles on the ends of the string operators. And uh, if you move an E particle around an M particle, um, the system will pick up a phase of minus one. That is a purely quantum phenomenon. And more generally, this phase doesn't have to be minus one. And what you have is called any else. So this is a very brief intro introduction to uh, topological order or gap to topological order. So we see that um, its phases is characterized by the topological feature, like genus of the manifold of the system. And the, the, you know, the ground state degeneracy is topologically protected, and uh, uh, which means if you add some local perturbations in the Hamiltonian, 
you still have the robust degeneracy of the ground state. And only some topolo topological loop configurations can, uh, sorry, topological loop perturbations can lead to the degeneracy. And also, as I just talked about, it has long range entanglement um, or topological entanglement. And its excitations are this in this in topological order, in, sorry, in toric code is electric and mag magnetic charge, but generally you have anions and also sometimes loop excitations. Now, um, so that was people's understanding of um, say quantum liquid uh, until a few years ago. And then um, this fracton order was discovered and uh, it sort of changed the people's view uh, toward this uh, topological order. So the, perhaps the simplest example is the X cube model. So the X cube model is defined on a 3D uh, cubic lattice with qubits living on the edges of the cubic lattice. Uh, so you have the following terms in your Hamiltonian. So first you have this um, um, cube term, which is a product of 12 Z operators on all the edges of this cube. Okay. And then you want to look for the other terms that commute with this um, A term. And what you find is that um, this, um, this B terms, which are the product of X operators on these vertices facing X, Y, or Z directions, commute with the A term. And the reason is that um, uh, each vertex term overlap with the cube term by two edges or, or no edges. So um, these A and B terms always commute. So you can then again write down the Hamiltonian where all the terms commute with each other. So you know exactly uh, what are the excitations and what are the ground states and so on. Yeah, so in this case, uh, the ground state is kind of a superposition of this so-called cage nets. So what you want to do is you write down these um, uh, so-called cage configurations like those, and uh, you make a superposition of them. So that will guarantee that um, it is both the eigenstate of the B terms and also the A terms. If you take a cut, of the system into, uh, if like if you check out the single layer of the system, then it kind of look like um, a toric code for each layer. But because of this, um, different layers are coupled together, so uh, it's not just uh, trivially some toric code layers. Um, one thing interesting is that um, the ground state degeneracy is robust. And it does not depend only on the topology of the manifold. Uh, in this case, um, log two of the ground state degeneracy is two times Lx plus two Ly plus two Lz, uh, which has to do with the size or geometry of your lattice. And then depending on the geometry, sorry, depending on the topology, you will have some uh, other corrections like minus three here, I think for the three torus. Yeah, so another interesting feature for this X cube model is the excitations. So now let's think about X acting an X operator on the vertical link here. So it commute with all the B terms, so nothing happens here, but there will be four of these cube terms uh, that anti-commute with this X operator. So that means um, acting the X operator here will create four excitations. Uh, uh, which are these stars here. Yep. Um, and uh, if you if you have, a say, a ladder of these X operators shown like this, then you can push two of these star excitations away. Yeah, if you, if you apply these X operators on this, um, uh, the links, um, I, showed here, then you can also push these two, um, these two star excitations up or down. However, there is no way you can move these two star excitations 
um, in this direction. And basically, um, for similar reasons, if you have, say, an isolated excitation in the lattice, um, then there is no way for you to move this single excitation without creating more excitations. Uh, because this uh, X operator always creates a uh, physical a quadruple of this, this kind of star excitation with this new mobility features is historical reason. A single fracton in the lattice is basically immobile. There is there is nothing that can move this um, um, uh, fracton without uh, uh, costing you more energies in the system. And uh, if you put two fractons together, then they become a plane now because they can move in the in these two directions shown by the green arrow, uh, which is a plane, but they cannot move in the third direction. Okay, so what about applying a Z operator in the system? So if you apply a Z operator, it will commute with um, with some of these um, these vertex X operators. Yeah. So what happens is if you apply a Z operator on the link, then it will create two excitations. For example, the excitation on the left is in uh, high energy states of these two operators. Yeah, because they have an overlap with the Z. And similarly for the other excitation on the right. So for this excitation, if you have a chain of Z operators, you can push it away in the direction shown by the green arrow. However, you will find that um, if you apply Z operators in other directions, you cannot really move this excitation away. And what, what, what's going to happen is that you're going to create another excitation that move in this direction, for example, but you will also leave something behind. Yeah. So uh, that is to say this blue excitation can only move in one dimension and is called a line now. So uh, these are the essential features of the X cube model. And as you can see, it has some um, new properties compared to the top to the Tori code I just introduced. Uh, for example, its face is characterized by not only the topology of the manifold, but also the geometric feature of your lattice. Yeah. The ground state degeneracy is also topologically protected, meaning any local perturbation you put in the Hamiltonian is, gonna, is not gonna lead to the degeneracy. However, uh, another new feature is the ground state degeneracy is actually massive and scale with the well, exponential of the linear system size. And furthermore, the excitations here, um, are fractons, linons, and uh, there are other excitations with even more unusual mobility. Compared to the case of Tori code or say conventional topological order, these anions and loops, they are generally free to move anywhere. Okay, so the discovery of fractal order uh, obviously proposed a lot of challenge for people to understand. For example, what is a quantum field theory description um, for this fractal order? So um, obviously it's not the conventional topological quantum field theory for topological order because um, the geometry of the manifold explicitly enters into the properties of this uh, of these fractal orders. And also how do you classify this um, how do you classify these fractal orders? And another interesting thing is that um, as you can see, there are some dipole or multiple conserving physics. And what's the consequence of this um, multiple conserving physics? is quite interesting. Um, and since, as I mentioned, geometry is quite crucial in determining the properties of these uh, fractal orders, uh, people start to think about the geometry of these fractal, fractal orders on geometry beyond the flat space. So there were some 
uh, work done uh, for mostly the fractal order on the general lattice. Yeah, so there is uh, quite a lot of development into different directions. And today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is mostly on the fourth one, which is the geometry beyond the flat space. And uh, I'm going to talk about a concrete geometry, which is the, uh, say, a stack of hyperbolic space, uh, which I'll explain later. And the new results coming out of this new geometry is basically, uh, first, the fractons have some new mobility constraints, and also to create a single fracton, you need a different pattern of operators, or in other words, you have um, new patterns of logical operators um, with some caveats. And also what was linons before now becomes trions and uh, uh, they turn out to be mobile, not in the line of the system, but on a fractal tree of the system. So uh, at the end of the talk, uh, you will understand how all this happens. Yeah, but before that, let me explain a bit more about the hyperbolic lattice. So the hyperbolic lattice is basically a tessellation of hyperbolic plane. And a hyperbolic plane is just a plane of constant negative curvature. So uh, one way to represent the plane or the or say uh, the plane with the lattice is to draw it in this way, which is called a Poincaré disk. So what happens here is that actually all the pentagons here are of the same size. They are all identical to each other. It just because it's just because of the way of the drawing, the pentagons away from the center looks smaller. Yeah. However, wherever you travel, say I travel to some pentagons over here and think of the pentagons here as the center, then uh, the lattice in the hyperbolic, uh, rep in the Poincaré representation will look like this again, yeah? And as you can imagine, the boundary of this lattice is actually infinitely far because you need to go through infinitely many pentagons to reach the boundary, yeah? So, um, well, it's... Uh, Next, so, so another way for you to understand this is to think about how to embed this um, in, uh, in, the, in the flat space. Yeah, but to do that, you have to kind of crumble the, the hyperbolic plane a little bit and it will become something like this. So as you can imagine, as you travel to the boundary or travel close to the boundary, the perimeter becomes becomes longer and longer and actually it grows exponentially. So, so you have to crumble the whole thing uh, like this. Yeah. So now for the hyperbolic lattice, uh, for this regular lattices, for example, here is tessellated by pentagons uh, where you have four pentagons meeting at each corner, right? So uh, this is labeled by a pair of numbers five, four, five means you have pentagons, you have, or you have five edges for each plaquette. And uh, four means you have four edges meeting at a vertex. So generally, uh, PQ tessellation of the hyperbolic lattice is possible as long as one over P plus one over Q is greater than one half. So, um, there are actually infinitely, infinitely many ways to tessellate the hyperbolic plane. Uh, in contrast, on flat space, um, as you can imagine, that's a limit of hyperbolic space in some sense. Uh, so then uh, the tessellation is constrained by one over P plus one over Q has to be exactly one half. So that gives you actually only three options. So here, uh, I'm showing a few different combinations of PQ. Uh, this is five, four, and four, six, and some others. And uh, we will actually work on the first two later. Um, yeah. So, uh, what, so now the lattice is basically, we have this hyperbolic disk or a hyperbolic lattice and we stack them on the third dimension Z, which is flat. So we just stack them in this way. 
And uh, then we want to do something that is um, similar to the construction of X cube model. So for example, here for the 5-4 tessellation, um, instead of a cube, what we have is this pentagon um, prism or a pentagon cage. Yeah. So then for the Z term, we want to write it down as the product of all the Zs on the edge of this uh, pentagon prism. Uh, then the next step is to find the commuting X operators. So uh, basically the key is that uh, if this uh, vertex operators overlap with this uh, cage or prism operators by two edges all the time, then it is guaranteed that uh, the Z and X operators commute with each other. And uh, uh, in this fa in this 5-4 tessellation, it is not so hard to convince yourself that um, uh, these three vertex operators are the X operators that commute with the Z. So, um, so then you have we have constructed the Hamiltonian completely with all these Z operators and X operators. And as you can see here, these uh, X operators are actually quite similar to the vertex terms in the X cube model. Yeah, just as, as a reminder of what's happening. Now, it turns out that this 5-4 tessellation is kind of um, um, most similar to X cube model. So I want to start here so it's easier for you to understand what's going on. So now let's look at the fractal excitations that's created by having this X operator on the vertical link of the lattice. Of course, you can also have the X operators for this in-plane edges, but um, there the property of the fractons is not so different from the, the X cube model. So what, what's different are, comes from these X operators on these vertical links. Now, if I do this, again, I will create four excitations. Each excitation is in the high energy state of this Z operator, yeah, because this X anti-commute with these Zs. Yeah, so if I look at um, in this perspective, then I have the X operator here, and then I have these four excitations, which are fractons. So now, as you can see, first thing to notice is that um, the two fractons as a bound state is also a plane now. And uh, on the hyperbolic plane, they can move in one direction. So this is how you do it. You just need this uh, string of X operators on, uh, on this uh, geodesic or on this arc. Uh, and that can push this bound state of fractons to all the way to the um, to the to the boundary or infinitely far, yeah. So that's the behavior of two fractons. Now, uh, to create a single fractal in the system, uh, what happens is that uh, you need to take these two fractal creation operators, and then you put them together in a particular way, so that one of the fractal here get pushed away. So uh, one way to create a fractal is like this. Oops, sorry. Where you have, in some sense, a bunch of uh, parallel lines that end up here. And then at the end of this um, chunk of X operators, you will have the fractals. And uh, so if you create two fractals and push them away, to infinity, then you have this uh, zero fractal creating operator. So in some sense, um, they are this topological uh, loop operators in, in the system. But of course, here we are not uh, defining the boundary condition yet. Now, how about the line nouns? So in this case, uh, we apply a Z operator on the in-plane edge, okay? So then it will create two excitations like before. And uh, each single excitation is in the high energy state of two of these um, X operators, uh, which is shown here. 
Okay, from a top-down perspective, it looks like this. And uh, the property of these excitations is not so different uh, from the X cube model linons. So you can have a linon that goes uh, travels on this arc. And then if you push the linon down to infinity, you got this um, zero linon operator, which is kind of a topological operator if you have the proper boundary condition. Yep. So uh, this is basically the property for these uh, hyperbolic fractal models for P being odd and Q being four. Okay. So it has this line nodes and the fractal dipole has 1D mobility in plane, but can also go out of plane. And then you have these geodesic operators that are. Uh, basically, X logical operators or say the topological loop operators. And uh, uh, the only thing different now is that to create a single fractal, what you need is this uh, truncated geodesics. So all these arcs are geodesics on the hyperbolic plane. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, basically the simplest case for this hyperbolic fractal orders. And if you compare it with the X cube model, you see that um, it's not that different. Now it gets a lot more interesting for the six four tessellation. Okay, so in this case, maybe it's four six actually. Okay, so in this case, anyway, a plaquette has the four edges. So I think it's the four six. Sorry. So each plaquette has four edges. And uh, on the vertex, you have six up, six edges that uh, meet together, okay? So uh, let us try to uh, build the Hamiltonian again. So first we have these uh, cube operators of Z again. Um, that's just like the X cube model, right? And now the next step is to look for the X operators that uh, commute with the Z operators. And that's where the difference appears. So um, again, the key in the construction is you want the X and ter Z terms to overlap by even number of edges. So uh, one way to construct this X operators is the product of all the six edges in plane as the X operator. So as you can see here, um, it overlap with this uh, Z term by two edges. Uh, which means they commute with each other. Okay, so another type of X operators is the following. Uh, first, you take the two vertical links, okay, colored by red here, and then you want to take some of these in-plane edges. And when you take the in-plane edges, note that you have six, and you want to select three of the edges that are not next to each other. Yeah, so you have two, two choices, which I made one here. And as you can see, again, it commute with the Z operator by uh, because they overlap by one of the vertical edge and one edge that's in plane. So uh, on each vertex, you have two such choices. You can select the other three edges too. So you have two of these uh, vertex operators, and then you also have the first one. So that completes the construction of the Hamiltonian. And you put, if you compare it with the X cube model, you see that um, um, these vertex operators uh, is quite different now, and they cause quite a lot of difference in the properties of the excitations. So now let's look at the fractons first. So suppose I apply an X operator on the vertical edge, now, because um, Q is six, this X operator actually um, overlap with six of these um, cube operators, right? So if I look top down, then that's saying that a single X operator creates six fractons. Yeah, so, so now the, the um, important thing is that uh, it is not a quadruple of the um, fracton. So a dipole fracton, or say a two fracton bound state, 
is not mobile anymore. And you can check this by uh, find out how you create two fractons. So to do so, uh, what you need is to first, you have to create this um, fractal tree that ends here. So the, the choice is basically you take one edge here and another edge here, and they have to uh, be not, not next to each other. And uh, once you reach the next vertex, you keep this uh, way of construction. You select half the edges that are not next to each other, which are these thick black ones. And you, you, you keep going and finish this construction. Yeah. And then this uh, truncated fractal tree will overlap with the lattice by some of these um, uh, vertices, right? And you apply X operators on all these vertices or these uh, vertical links next to the vertices um, on the tree. And by doing that, you will see that uh, first here, you will create two fractons because this X anti-commute with the two cube operators here. However, if you look at um, the other, uh, the other cubes that are adjacent to the tree, you will see that all these cubes uh, overlap with this uh, big X product of X operator by two edges. For example, this cube overlapped by this edge and this edge. And if you move down, it's the same story. So there is no more other fractons created in the system. So that's how you create a pair of fractons. And as you can see here, um, there isn't a way to push these two fractons uh, somewhere else without creating more new fractons, yeah? And uh, for a similar reason, the pattern you need to create a single fracton is also uh, quite, uh, quite new, which is that you have to have a lot of this truncated fractal tree and you put them together in this pattern which look in some ways like a fractal of fractals. And then you have a single fracton here. Now, uh, if you look for the uh, um, operator that creates zero fractons, then that will be to construct the entire fractal tree without cutting it off and, uh, and, you know, apply and multiply the, all the X operators on the vertices of the tree. So this is, in some sense, the logical um, operator for this uh, model. Or uh, in, our, in other words, these are the topological loops, but now they are not just loops, they are uh, topological fractal trees for the system. Now, there is another way to create uh, fractons. To see the second way, uh, I, I want you to look at the second picture first. So what happens here is I, again, take this um, fractal tree and then I select the entire red region that's bounded by the tree. And, uh, um, and then what I do is I multiply all the X operators in the shaded uh, red region. Okay, then you can check that inside the red region, each cube term uh, overlap with four X operators. On the edge of the red region, each cube term overlap with the big X operators by, by two edges and outside it's okay, right? So, so again, this thing is a topological operator, a logical operator in the sense it doesn't create any fractons. And uh, to create a single fracton in a different way, what you do is you, so you find two of, um, you build two of such um, logical operators, the red one and the green one, and then you just take the overlap of them. And you, you, the operator is the product of X in this uh, overlapped region. So, um, so as we demonstrated before, for all the cubes on the, on the edge, it's two overlap. Inside this shaded region, it's a four overlap. So no, no, no fracton is created. So the only fracton created is here. So this is uh, in some sense similar to the 
original X cube model where you need a corner of a membrane operator to create a single fracton. Yeah. So these are the features of the fractons. And now let's look at uh, uh, linons, or in this case, uh, trions. So again, we can apply a Z operator on this um, in-plane edge. So that will create two excitations. And each single excitation is in the high energy states for two of these three um, operators of X, okay? So first, they are always this um, in the excited state of this, the third one, which, which is the product of the six in-plane edges, yeah? And second, for, for one of these, uh, sec, the, so, okay, among the first and second X operators, uh, this excitation will be in the excited states for one of these two operators. Yeah, and in this case, it's this one. And the same applies to the other excitation on the other side. Yeah, so this is to say that a single Z operator creates two trions here. Now let's think about the mobility of a single trion. So what we, we just showed is actually that applying a Z operator now, so suppose you originally have a trion in the system, and now you apply the Z operator, then it will annihilate the trion here, um, but create a different trion here. So that's the trion hopping from here to here. Now, uh, you can do this in three directions, which are the three directions that's, um, that are, the, are colored red, or in other words, that the three excitations corresponding to the, um, this excited operator um, correspond to the three in-plane edges of this excited operator, right? However, if I apply a Z operator, for example, here, then this Z operator will not um, annihilate the excitation for the first operator here, right? So it will create something here, but um, then at the original place, um, they, the, the trion is not uh, annihilated. So that is to say this trion cannot move in these three directions, but it's okay in the other three direction. So now if you put all of this together, you will see that um, the way a trion can move um, is that it can move on a fractal tree. And how you construct this fractal tree is, um, is the same way you construct the, the fracton fractal tree earlier, which is you select three edges on each vertex that are not next to each other. And once you make this selection, um, these edges or this tree extend to other vertices and uh, you just keep repeating the procedure that give you a fixed tree on the lattice. And a tree is free to move on this fractal tree, but it cannot move out of this tree. Again, here you have the logical operator or the topological loop operator, which are the Z operators or product of the Z operators on the path of the tree. So it's not the, the entire tree, but just the path of the tree on the tree from one infinity to another. Okay, so that's the properties for this um, uh, four or six hyperbolic lattice or more generally is the properties for all the P even and Q greater than six uh, fracton order. So we call it Y cube model because these uh, vertex operators, these in-plane op vertex operators look like in Y. Now, in terms of, um, to, just to summarize what happened, first the, tree, the line now become a trion and it's, it's able to move on a fractal tree in the lattice. And uh, in-plane fractal dipole has no in-plane mobility anymore, but of course it can still move out of the plane. So it become a line now in the Z direction. Now, in terms of um, creating a fractal, 
there are two ways. One, one way is to stack these um, truncated fractal trees together. And the other way is to have a membrane operator that has a corner. And correspondingly, this X logical operator uh, has two patterns. One is just the X operators on all the vertices of a tree. And the other one is all the X operators on the entire membrane that's bounded by the tree. Okay, so now uh, the fact that you have these fractal tree properties is basically because Q is greater than, than six. Yeah, so here Q is six. So you have this um, fractal tree with three branches. And if you have, for example, Q equals eight, then you can imagine you will have a fractal tree with four edges on each vertex. And uh, this Q equals four case is in some sense a limit of the fractal tree where you have only two, you select only two edges on the vertex. So then you end up having just a geodesic line. And then, um, for these membrane operators, they can happen because P is even, so that uh, when you have these membranes, these X operators, um, you know, they overlap with the cage operators by by P vertical links. Yeah, so it has to P has to be even for these operators to commute with the cage operators. So so P has to be even for this to happen. So as you can see now, depending on P being odd or even, you will have these um, properties in the corner. Uh, you will have it for P even and you will not have it for P odd. And then for Q uh, being four or greater than six, greater or equal than six, you will either have just line now and this 1D mobility or you will have this uh, fractal tree properties. Okay, so in this table, we summarized all these properties of different um, hyperbolic fractal models. And as you can see, depending on the lattice, the fractal order properties are uh, kind of drastically different. Maybe of course, we did. Yep. And also, have people ask questions. Let me ask something. Yep. I just been really naive. So, is the property of the, like the, this latest does it encode any like uh, maybe the hyperbolic information in a sense do we know even though the the notion of curvature here in a sense can i de define all the latest model just on flat space but with the same property um uh, i guess this should be a first question i should ask in the very beginning but in any case i ask no I see. So, if we just okay. write this model on flat space, we, we can also get the same result. Is that correct? So, I mean, if you mean flat space with the, um, say, discrete translational symmetry, then I'm not aware of any models that do that. I mean, there are these type two fractal models which also have fractal structure, but but they are say, a different kind of fractal structure in some sense. Yeah, so yeah, actually- well, Maybe I can jump into the discussion. Um, yeah, Juna, that's an interesting question. And uh, so there's, you know, there's the geometry of the manifold, but here, I guess we're kind of thinking of uh, translating that geometry into a, a lattice model such that you know, all the points in the lattice model are kind of equidistant on that manifold. And you're right, you could just put this lattice onto a flat space, but then you'd have some weird properties where certain points in the lattice would become extremely close. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I know, guess uh, I, can re I can rephrase my question. Maybe this is more like graph theory question. I, I guess I'm not aware of the detail of graph theory. So given this graph, uh, how does this graph encode the information of the underlying geometry or manifold? Does it have to need to be curved uh, with 
with the with the curvature, maybe hyperbolic that type of things. Or does it that that does it not necessarily imply that? I'm I'm sure the property you described so far all follow. I'm just try to understand something really simple. Yeah, I think say if your graph, if you don't care about the say the length of each edge on your graph, then indeed you can embed it in a flat space, uh, which it, for example, you can embed it in this uh, hyperbolic disk in the literally a, a graph like that, right? Uh, but the problem is as you go further to the boundary, you will have very, very short edges. If you do require all the edges of your graph to be of the same length, then I think uh, you can you can only embed it in hyperbolic. Sorry, you can only embed it in the hyperbolic space, or in flat space. What can happen is that um, you have to wiggle your as you go further and further to the boundary. You have to wiggle this thing uh, very drastically, right? And that's just the one slice and uh, then you will have difficulty stacking it up in the third dimension yeah no problem thanks okay uh, i think i think there are some fact maybe about graph theory I, I i can check with others maybe people can tell me but one interesting fact is that i suppose graph theory tell us something about the mathematics of the underlying uh, manifold that you put in maybe even with a metric and Riemannian mm -hmm. manifold, and it gives some property. Then the next question is that if you put the Hamiltonian latest model on this graph, can you detect something more than what has been known for the graph theory? I guess that's some. I see. I see. Maybe, maybe yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, but I, yeah, honestly, I don't really know the answer. The people yeah. study graph; they don't put a Hilbert space on the on the side or on the links. But now you have a Hilbert space and. Whether this underlying uh, phase of matter you construct can tell something more than just the graph. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's quite interesting, and I think uh, actually, um, so let me find the references here. I think Shu Hong. Uh, yeah, I think Shu Hong and his collaborators, and also Epizu and Han, um, they have an ind independent work. They they showed that some of this um, kind of fracton gauge theory uh, has to do with the complexity of the graph, although I don't really understand the details. I only know the result. So I guess that's one example of this, um, say, topological states or quantum states give you information about the graph. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe just to sorry if I were to chime in, but one other perspective, Julian, is that um, I mean, generically, one would like to find a model with translational invariance um, for various reasons. It's easier to extend the thermodynamic limit. Um, one could formulate it in K space to try down the field theory. And so you see that if you were to try and just formulate it in terms of the graph theory, um, then this concept of translation uh, disappears. So the Poincaré disk, if you embed it in flat space, is obviously not translationally invariant, right? Um, so for the same reason, you could argue that in a flat space, why don't people consider quasi-crystals, something like Penrose tilings, right? You could do that, but the problem is again, is that one wouldn't, such a graph, if you think of it mathematically abstractly, would not be translationally invariant. So one way to see our result is that what we are doing in, um, hyperbolic space is to constraining to models that are translationally invariant. Yeah. Okay. So sure, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Okay. Good. So uh, I think this uh, basically this uh, slide is the core result of the of our work, which is uh, we looked at some very concrete uh, beyond flat space lattices and um, uh, have shown that there are quite a lot interesting properties of this fractal order. Now for outlook, uh, the first thing you may notice is that here Q has to be even 
because otherwise um because otherwise there is no way to construct this um these two vertex operators which require you to select half the edges right so uh that is to say q odd cases are not covered here uh hank chen i think do you want to ask something yeah it was uh just like basically a clarifying question for um, a previous comment regarding like translational symmetry i think yeah i think it makes sense that you want to put a lattice that is translationally symmetric and then if you have like one of her, you know the fact that you have hyperbolic tessellation to get translational symmetry you need to have hyperbolic geometry right yes yeah so yeah. the question is like in, in the models that you constructed, where can I see this translation symmetry being relevant? I think maybe it's in how the line on is travel, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah, so for, yeah, so to begin with, the, the hyperbolic um, lattice does has its um, lattice symmetry which is not the usual translational symmetry um, but as you can see for example it has a rotational symmetry um, how does it affect the properties of these fractal models um, yeah i haven't thought about this um, so more concretely what uh, what what are you asking? Like, um, yeah, I I just wanted to know. Like, let's say I want to analyze the model in Fourier space, right? Yes. Let's say I want to do a Fourier transform. Then I can um, basically label. So instead of the concrete disk, I think about the upper half plane instead. Let's say. Okay. Yeah. So I model the upper half plane by some um, by some group. And I can label the momenta using characters of this group. At least that's yes. one way to do it. So um, now the question is, okay, how do I see properties of these excitations, I guess, manifest in like Fourier space essentially, because that's I like see. Fourier space is directly tied to the, the lattice symmetry. Yeah, so, so I think in this case, um, uh, for for this particular exactly solvable models, um, if you have such uh, Fourier transformations, then um, say for example the fractons will just occupy a band as um, as a flat band, and because here um, there is no hopping terms yet, uh, but I, yeah, but I do know there are some other say electron hopping models defined on uh, hyperbolic space. There are some, some works in recent years uh, where they have say this, a sense of dispersion in that uh, Fourier space. Um, yeah, so, so if you want, you can check, uh, check those works, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Idre, yeah. Thanks. I just have a naive question. If you calculate something like neutral information or entanglement entropy in these models, do they follow some exotic stuff like root technology formula? Uh, yes, actually they do. Um, so in the next slide, I will. All right. Thank you. Cover that. Yeah. Um, right. So I just mentioned the Q odd case. Uh, they are completely different constructions, and where trying to understand them, but the vertex operators are not so easy to understand. And uh, so related to what EG just asked, uh, field theory aspect, for example, one question you can ask is how you can describe trions. Uh, so what we suspect is that um, these trions are uh, basically described by this uh, piadic model, uh, I don't have time to explain what's that, but it's basically a simplest toy mode of holography that lives on a fractal tree only. Yeah. So, for example, that will give you something um, 
like uh, uh, Liu, Takana, Liu Takayanagi formula for entanglement entropy and so on. Uh, so for the piatic model, uh, it's mostly pushed forward by Steve Gubser and his collaborators. And uh, so actually in some of my earlier works on the a classical version of this fractal order. Well, it's not fractal order anymore. It's a classical fractal model on uh, just a hyperbolic plane. Uh, you can actually show that there are some analogy of uh, Liu Takanagi formula and uh, other holographic properties. Yeah. Um, so, okay, one thing I didn't write down here is that, um, as you can see, there are many uh, very weirdly shaped topological operators are logical, topological, not loop anymore, but uh, tree operators and another kind of uh, strange logical operators. So uh, one question you can ask is what's the quantum information uh, property um, of this uh, fracton order? Like how robust do they encode a logical state and so on? Um, yeah, finally, I think um, there has been uh, a few works on these fractal orders on general graphs. And uh, it would be interesting to connect what we did with um, these um, general graph works. Yeah, so so that's the outlook. And uh, right, so I think I'll just um, conclude with this slide showing the all the say, most non-trivial features of these fractal orders in hyperbolic space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Han. Any questions from the audience? Oh, Izzy has more questions? Yes, yeah. yeah, so I have another question too. For toy code, even on open open plan, we can still implement some boundary condition to let it have some type of ground state degeneracy. I wonder, can you have some type of exotic ground state degeneracy by implementing a special type of uh, boundary condition? And if so, what does the ground state degeneracy look like? Here? I see. Uh, so the answer to our question is yes. And uh, uh, we... So when we do this project, we uh, discussed this briefly. So uh, basically the boundary condition is whether you want to condense the fractons on the boundary or you want to condense, say, the trions on the boundary. And uh, and then depending on what you condensate, um, either this uh, fracton or either this X operators or, or this... Um, uh, Z operators on the path of a fractal tree will become the say topological or logical operators that uh, take you from one ground state to another. And uh, so exactly how many ground states are there, we did not count that. Um, but this is certainly doable because um, there are actually some uh, formulas that tells you how many trees are there as you grow the, the the size of the lattice. So yeah, sorry, I don't have that answer, but that's definitely a very interesting question. And um, uh, I think the tool, the mathematical tools there to, to do such calculations are also available. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, actually, I think I just try to follow up. I think it it was asking about this Liu Takayanagi formula, but you 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 seem to give a positive answer, but I didn't see how do you how did you answer? Okay. Can you explain again what what did you say? What did you try to explain? Um. Okay. Let me think about the simplest way to. to answer that. Um, okay, so let, let me try to give you the simplest example, right? So you see that here you have a line of, um, you have a line of X operators that's that live on this geodesic, right? Um, so which means if you apply this operator, 
say if you have the proper boundary condition defined and you if you apply this operator then um it takes you to another to another ground state and uh, what happens is that um on this end of this geodesic and this end of this geodesic will at the same time see the change of the ground state right? because they are connected by this um operator Terms, uh, which means actually there are some um, a quantum entanglement that um, happens between the end of this, between one end of this geodesic to the end of the other geodesic. Okay. So regarding Liu Takanagi, uh, one, one thing you can do is then I can ask, let me try to annotate. I can divide my boundary into two parts. Let's call it A and the complement of A, AC. And then I can ask for this type of um, entanglement, how much, um, how much entanglement is there between A and AC? And as I showed here, it's simply in, end up being uh, counting the number of geodesics that uh, goes from A to AC. See, all these blue ones uh, contribute some uh, some of this uh, entanglement entropy, yeah. However, if I think about the red geodesic, this one, because it ends, both of it, both of its ends are in AC, then uh, it doesn't contribute any entanglement between A and AC. So then, um, the such entanglement entropy between A and AC is simply um, measured by counting how many geodesics you have going from A to AC. And you take if you take the bottleneck of this, say, flow of geodesic, then it's this uh, green line here. And that's exactly the minimal covering surface that separate A and AC. And uh, so that, that actually gives you the RT formula. No, thanks. I get it. Yeah. So this is, yeah. So this is explained in quite a bit detail in in these uh, earlier works I did for the, but that's for the classical model though. Yeah. Okay. If no more question, then we should thank Han again. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Juven. I'll send you a request.